but there are abundant um, uh, examples and evidence of um, how when you don't vest private property rights in things like fisheries, forests, farmland and, and so on, that it simply gets um, uh, abused uh, to the point of total destruction. Thank you for that introduction and, and um, thank you for your welcome here. I'm delighted to be here. I, I enjoy getting away from the um, main job to give these uh, kinds of talks, so I, ho I hope it's fruitful. Let me just, um, it's, it's interesting of course that we start a talk on the environment with a problem of an invasion of, of, of bees. But, um, uh, and I apologise also for having to, to do a language switch. My, my daughter speaks fluent German, she spent the last year in Germany. Uh, but I'm afraid I, I, I'm, I have a daughter who speaks fluent German and a wife who speaks fluent French. And there's been almost no economic need for me to learn um, a language uh, at, at all, other than English. Um, I just want to preface my uh, talk by making two remarks. So we had this climate strike uh, yesterday in, in Britain, I think elsewhere as well. I vaguely heard it uh, on, on the news, on, on, in the, on the radio, in the taxi, on the way here in, in German. I think that's what they were talking about. And um, in the UK, the um, climate strike or, in the, or the big demonstration in London was joined by a very overt demonstration from uh, what I'm not sure whether it was the Communist Party. I don't think the Communist Party exists, um, but people flying... Um, uh, hammer and sickle flags and um, shouting communist slogans and, and this type of thing. So I think it's just worth prefacing this lecture, which is about markets and the environment, by saying it's almost impossible to find um, any system of economic organisation which has been so catastrophic for environmental outcomes as, um, as, as communist and socialistic systems. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. And one of those reasons is that they were extremely inefficient at producing almost everything. They, in other words, they used up more inputs to produce a given volume of outputs than their equivalent market-based systems, and that included more environmental inputs to produce a given volume of outputs. So if you, uh, things are improving now, but if you go to former communist countries, you find dead rivers, dead lakes, um, appalling uh, deforestation, degradation, uh, and, and pollution. And it's, it's strange that the um, left of um, the economics of the political spectrum never really reflect on this when they're talking about uh, environmental issues. Um, the, the second thing I'll, I'll just want to say is to those of you who are not Catholic, I'm going to root this entirely uh, in Catholic social teaching. And you might think, well, what has Catholic social teaching got to do with me if you're not a Catholic? Well, the, the encyclical letters uh, which form um, part of that body of Catholic social teaching that are produced by, uh, that, uh, uh, produced by uh, the church, not normally signed off by popes, um, are normally addressed to all people of goodwill. And they're based, of course, on uh, scripture, revelation, tradition, the church's interpretation of natural law. And the sorts of things which I shall uh, talk about from the Catholic social encyclicals and also quote from the um, Catholic social encyclicals are really no different from the sorts of statements which might be made by uh, non-Catholics on these uh, kinds of issues. They're not in any sense uh, unique uh, or, or, or novel. And the, in 20, so the, the, the Catholic Church has, has made statements on or written um, uh, documents relating to social teaching or political and economic affairs um, in a very formal sense since 1891. And many of those statements have referred to environmental issues. But in 2015, Pope Francis uh, issued an encyclical, a very long encyclical. Um, some could, would say that it could perhaps do with, a, could have done with an extra edit. A very long, a long, very long encyclical uh, called Laudato Si, which was, um, simple, which was uh, really more or less uh, entirely devoted to environmental issues. And I shall talk about that uh, to quite a degree. So Laudato Si, um, starts uh, by talking about or writing about the harm that we've inflicted on the earth, which Pope Francis, um, following St. Francis, describes as Sister Earth. 
And the Pope tells us that our bodies are made up of the elements of the earth and that we breathe and drink the products of the earth. In other words, he's arguing that we have an intrinsic uh, relationship um, with the earth and we should love it. Not, that, not like we love other human beings, um, but in a way that we should cherish and nurture it. Um, and in paragraph 33 of that encyclical, Pope Francis notes that the different species are not merely resources that should be exploited by the human person, but they have value in themselves because they are created um, uh, creatures. They have a lesser value than the human person, but nevertheless they um, have a value. Now, people are often, uh, whether one is uh, particularly supportive of Pope Francis or particularly critical of Pope Francis, people often seem to look for divides between the types of thing which Pope Francis says and the types of thing which his predecessors uh, say. And those divides, it has to be said, are, are uh, greatly e exaggerated. And if you go back through the um, uh, teaching of the um, uh, Catholic Church, you will find very similar things being said by uh, previous popes. So this is Pope Paul VI in uh, an apostolic exhortation, a form of communication um, from, from, um, uh, from, from the church to the people, uh, common, uh, in, uh, writing in 1971. Man is suddenly becoming aware that by an ill-considered exploitation of nature, he risks destroying it, that is, destroying the environment and becoming, in his turn, the victim of his own degradation. Not only is the material environment becoming a permanent menace, pollution and refuse, new illness and absolute destructive capacity, but the human framework is no longer under man's control, thus creating an environment tomorrow which may well be intolerable. Um, and and that's, the, that's the first... Um, very formal statement on what you might call modern ecological um, concerns that, that, I, that I can find uh, coming, coming out of the, the, the church. But the whole uh, framework is based, based, if you like, on ancient um, theology. And Paul VI's successor, John Paul II, in his um, first encyclical, um, actually raised the issue of, of, of the environment. And in doing so, as is typical of uh, his encyclicals, he incorporated into his analysis important uh, anthropological and philosophical as well as theological uh, insights. So, for example, John Paul II said, Man often seems to see no other meaning in his natural environment than what serves for immediate use and consumption. Yet it was the Creator's will that man should communicate with nature as an intelligent and noble master and guardian, and not as a heedless exploiter and destroyer. So within that statement, you not only have, um, if, if, if you like, pre, um, uh, anticipating uh, uh, Pope Francis' point about the importance of nurturing, caring for and loving the environment and, and other created creatures, but you also have, very typical of John Paul II, an attack on consumption for its own sake. Um, and um, a reiteration of the importance of being both masters and guardians uh, of the environment, uh, because it's our right and duty um, to be so. Um, and John Paul II uh, stressed as well that life itself is a gift which must be respected and which is part of the uh, environment, joining what Benedict XVI uh, called the, mo the moral eco ecology to respect for the environment. So Benedict XVI um, pointed out that it doesn't make sense to debase the human person whilst at the same time purporting to protect the environment. So the idea, for example, that you might campaign for the destruction of life through abortion, um, as many environmentalists do, whilst at the same time campaigning for the protection of the environment, is just simply an absurdity. And um, Benedict XVI was very clear in pointing out that kind of uh, contradiction. Um, in another social encyclical, uh, uh, John Paul II, Solicitudio Re Socialis, um, said that um, he, he introduced the issue of the environment in a, a rather more positive way, saying that there were hopeful uh, signs. And he said, among today's positive signs, we must also mention a greater realisation of the limits of available resources. 
and of the need to respect the integrity and the cycles of nature and to take them into account when planning for development rather than sacrificing them to certain demagogic ideas about the latter. Today this is called ecological concern. And I shall talk um, later in the, in the second part of this, um, talks here about the, the, limit, the limits of available resources. And there's a, um, there was a meeting back in the early 1970s which, became, uh, which gave rise to what became known as the Club of Rome, which talked about the limits of available resources and led to all sorts of apocalyptic, apocalyptic fears and writings and research about natural resources running out. Um, yet that never seems to happen. Of all the environmental, uh, environmental problems that we uh, might have, and there are many, the one thing which ne ha never seems to happen is natural resources running out. And I shall talk about how one of the reasons for that uh, is because of markets, <coughs> property rights, and the price system ensures that resources um, are effectively uh, conserved. And um, Pope John Paul II's um, uh, point that he makes here in paragraph 26 is immediately followed by discussion of the dangers of consumerism. This is a continual theme of John Paul II, who in general has written in a way which um, uh, was relatively positive about the market, but he uh, continually pointed out the dangers of consumerism and um, the, the problem of uh, uh, having, just having, trying to have more rather than uh, being and having a well-ordered life. Um, now, Pope Benedict XVI uh, mentioned uh, the environment or referenced the environment in a number of uh, homilies and written statements. And I've already mentioned how he um, integrated his thinking about the importance of being open to the transmission of life and, and uh, preserving and nur nurturing life, the human ecology as he called it, with um, uh, natural ecology. And, and in a uh, social encyclical which he wrote, which was delayed because of the uh, financial crisis, um, he said, um, today the subject of development is also closely related to the, sorry, the subject of development, as in economic development in poor countries, is also closely related to the duties arising from our relationship to the natural environment. The, the environment is God's gift to everyone, and in our use of it, we have a responsibility towards the poor, towards future generations, towards humanity as a whole. In nature, the believer recognises the wonderful result of God's creative activity, which we may use responsibly to satisfy our legitimate needs, material or otherwise, whilst respecting the intrinsic um, balance of um, creation. This, I think, raises the question of stewardship, which is a, a common theme in um, um, uh, uh, scripture-inspired um, uh, Protestant uh, uh, comment on and, and uh, theology uh, related to the environment, that the nature is a gift, um, but it's a gift that we should care for and pass on to uh, the next generation. In fact, the, the, the politician who first raised um, most publicly the issue of environmental issues and global warming. Anybody tell me who that was? You might be surprised. Which, which politician first uh, was the first to make a major intervention on the... Yeah. Al Gore. Like, Al Gore. Uh, be, okay. Be, it was Margaret Thatcher. Yes, okay. So Margaret Thatcher, before Al Gore, um, was really the first person, was the first uh, prominent politician to make a, a substantial, substantial um, uh, reference to and speech about global warming. And um, she was, of course, a non-Catholic Christian, and she made this reference towards uh, about the importance of stewardship and passing on the, um, uh, the earth to the next generation in a similar condition to that in which uh, uh, we, we found it. And this, that was towards the end of her uh, uh, premiership. <clears throat> and, and coming back to Pope Francis, um, which I, I hope now you can see is, uh, is not in any sense... Uh, novel, or you might say not even especially original, that's not meant as a criticism, uh, in his teaching, but is continuing and developing uh, a tradition. Um, he raises many similar themes to those of John Paul II, Paul VI, and Pope Benedict uh, in his theological reflections in that encyclical Laudato Si, and, and in other comment. And in paragraph 67 of that document, he explains how man, having dominion over the earth, 
the uh, phrase used in Genesis, does not mean that we should be domineering and destructive. Again, if you think of a, a um, beneficent, benevolent uh, monarch that has dominion over a kingdom, it doesn't mean to say that they try to destroy that kingdom. They, they, um, they exist, they reign in order to uh, look after it rather than destroy it. Um, and finally, on this, kind, on, on this, uh, this background, if you like, in, in, in Catholic social teaching, uh, the, um, the one document which really summarises Catholic teaching on um, all issues, both theological and, socialism is a, uh, so, and, and social, is the Catechism of the um, uh, Catholic Church. And in um, paragraph 339 of the Catechism, which is repeated in Laudato Si, it stated, each of the various creatures willed in its own being reflects in its own way a ray of God's infinite wisdom and goodness. Man must therefore respect the particular goodness of every creature to avoid any disordered use of things. So, so no, in creation, man has a special place, um, but it, it is our, we are living disordered lives if we simply disrespect all other um, aspects of creation. I guess that's the, the message that's um, uh, running uh, through all of this. And an attitude of life which involves just trying to accumulate more material things um, is an aspect of that and in turn arguably leads to more environmental destruction and a strain being put on um, natural resources and so on. Now when a social encyclical is, is um, published and these things are published every maybe on average every seven or eight years and then there are more statements in between which are issued which are sometimes uh, controversial on political, economic or social matters, when these things are published by um, the Catholic Church, just as when um, comment on economic or political matters is made by other Christian leaders, there's a, a rush by the press to comment not on the detail of the theological reflections, um, but on the particular political statements that uh, are being made. No, is the Pope saying something that's critical of capitalism or in favour of uh, markets and economic development? Is the Pope criticising socialism or whatever? So as soon as these encyclicals um, are, are, are published, you know, there's always a press conference immediately afterwards. None of the questions at that, that press conference, uh, at least none of the questions which receive any publicity, are about theological aspects. They're all about the political aspects. So, and um, when they're issued, I, 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 I would often, and, and many people in my position, be telephoned by the press within an hour or two to ask for comment. So there's always a temptation, and actually in those circumstances you have no real option, to open the encyclical in the middle to find out what, it's, um, uh, what the encyclical is saying about these political and economic issues, uh, rather than starting at the beginning and looking at what the analysis is and the theological um, uh, points which lead up to that, um, th those p political and economic uh, statements, which are really uh, uh, trivial as, as compared with the importance of the theological uh, analysis. And it has to be said that most people who did that in relation to Laudato Si um, took the message from Laudato Si, not without good reason, I don't think, that the Pope was, Pope Francis was saying something that was um, anti-consumerism, that would be expected, uh, anti-market, uh, anti-development to some extent, although not um, that needs some qualification, um, and anti-globalisation. So, and, and uh, he said other things perhaps which uh, are along those lines, so people were not too surprised, maybe that, that those um, things which hinted at that within the encyclical uh, confirmed um, uh, preconceived ideas uh, already. When you read the encyclical in full, which I have to say I didn't until some weeks uh, later, I think the context of those remarks actually is, is much more important and actually the politics and the economics are, are, um, uh, are, are really trivial issues compared with the theological uh, reflections. And Pope Francis asked in the encyclical to, that we should engage in dialogue. So uh, a number of us have tried to engage in dialogue and particularly tried to engage in dialogue about these uh, economic and pol political, uh, political issues. Um, <clears throat> 
so the question for those interested in public policy, I think, Christians interested in public policy, is how best do we have a political and economic order so that we have a society which is well ordered to preserving environmental goods, and also, of course, in other respects. And I would argue that that's um, where the analysis of Laudato Si and maybe the analysis of um, much Catholic Church teaching and other Christian comment, I should add, on environmental issues um, uh, needs more debate and, and where that analysis is, is, is lacking. So I want to talk about the importance of markets and private property for pre preserving and promoting uh, the environment. The, there is a um, tendency, I think, to imply in Catholic Church teaching and in other Christian denominational uh, teaching on environmental issues that the market and private property are problems uh, which uh, cause environmental destruction and which need a response of uh, more uh, central government control and direction of our actions uh, and rather than the church trying to understand and embrace um, the subtlety, and it is a subtle way, in which market mechanisms and the institution of private property in particular are important for preserving and nurturing environmental goods. And I, I think, uh, you know, if, if, if you look back through the history of um, the church's teaching on these kinds of issues uh, over 800 years, you'll get a very strong understanding within the Catholic Church on the importance of private property and the market economy for uh, free, civilised, uh, sustainable, uh, economic uh, way of living. But when these environmental issues were picked up from the 1970s onwards, you seem to get precisely um, uh, the, the opposite. You seem to get the impression that the, um, that the church thinks that private property rights are problematical and market economies in general are problematical when it comes to the preservation of environmental resources. So, in Centesimus Annus, an encyclical published by John Paul II in 1991, which was generally favourable towards a market economy, um, John Paul II raises what he describes as an ecological question in relation to private property, very specifically. And he suggests that it is a task of the state to provide for the defence and preservation of common goods such as the natural and human environments, which cannot be safeguarded simply by market forces. So in doing that, in, in saying that, he seems to be calling into question the ability of private ownership to protect the environment. And as I say, this is a key statement, I think, from a Pope who in general echoed very faithfully the strong line in favour of private property um, uh, which was, uh, um, appeared in the teaching of his predecessors. Pope Francis, in Laudato Si, essentially reiterates that statement and continues the discussion about um, private property and the environment with a negative emphasis. So he raises the question of private property and the environment in uh, chapter 2 of the encyclical, talks about it in a, for, uh, three paragraphs, and he, uh, Pope Francis says that the Christian tradition has never recognised private property rights as absolute, well, that's true, um, and, say, and that they must be subordinated to a social purpose, well, that's also true. And then specifically, Pope Francis says, the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity and the responsibility of everyone. In other words, the natural environment is a resource which in some sense should be uh, socialised rather than um, subject to the institutions of private property and the market. And Pope Francis then just moves on in a very long encyclical not to address the subject again. So he leaves totally unconsidered the question, are private property rights the best way to deal with the protection of the natural environment for the good of all? And there's been an immense amount of work done by economists on this issue in the last 30 or 40 years, including a couple of Nobel Prizes at least, given for work in this field. And it's very strange that in all the committees which led to the production of Laudato Si, none of that work seems to have been taken on board or referenced, or indeed people who are working in those fields who come from right across the political spectrum, sort of left-leaning communitarian to... Um, uh, uh, to um, uh, 
people who are strong believers in free markets, that none of that work seems to have been referenced or taken into account uh, or, or brought into consideration in the consultation uh, process. The whole point of um, private property and the market economy in the long history of the teaching of the church is that it's deemed to have a social purpose. So the argument of Thomas Aquinas um, and the late scholastics and Catholic social teaching more generally has always been that private property is necessary for the common good. So I would argue that Pope Francis here is just simply posing a false dichotomy. Now, how can private property um, work for the common good? Well, Thomas Aquinas suggested um, three reasons. Firstly, he said that, that this is, remember this is 800 years ago, uh, private property encourages people to work harder because they are working for what they could own. If people um, uh, couldn't uh, own what they worked for, then people would shirk. Secondly, private property ensures that affairs are conducted in a more orderly manner. People understand what they are responsible for, rather than everything being the responsibility of everybody. And I'll come back to this um, clause uh, in, in a moment, or this phrase. And thirdly, private property ensures peaceful relationships. Now, if Thomas Aquinas were um, uh, um, thinking about modern environmental problems, which of course were not really an issue when there were so few people uh, inhabiting the earth, I think he would have added that private property, if uh, people can get the benefit and the fruits of nurturing property, rather than being, than being spread across a community as a whole, that private property is much more likely to lead, uh, uh, private property rights are much more likely to lead to property being looked after rather than destroyed. And I'll come to that issue um, in, in a second. And it's interesting to compare Laudato Si, which, um, um, uh, which says, as I, uh, which, uh, in which it's written, as I mentioned above, the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity, and the responsibility of everyone. If we make something our own, it is only to administer it for the good of all. With Aquinas, who says, human affairs are more efficiently organized if each person has his own responsibility to discharge. There would be chaos if everybody cared for everything. In other words, 800 years on, um, sorry, 800 years earlier, Aquinas seems to have answered the question that Pope Francis is implicitly asking um, uh, here, that if, we, um, if, 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 everything, um, uh, if everything is a responsibility of everyone, it will become the responsibility of no one. But if we actually uh, divide property up and we have responsibility for our own property, we're much more likely to uh, care for it and, and nurture it. And one, ex one good example, there, there are several examples uh, which e economists have looked into of um, uh, of uh, how to uh, bring these ideas into effect, how private property rights are important and markets are important for preserving the environment. Um, perhaps the uh, most profound one is uh, in the area of, of uh, uh, fishing rights, which I'll, I'll, I'll come on to in, in a couple of moments. But I want to just say something about um, uh, property rights in water first, because these were raised uh, by Pope Francis, who said something really rather what would be really rather strange to uh, e economists in Laudato Si, <coughs> uh, um, which is important in this context. So this is what Pope Francis said about water. Even as the, equal even as the quality of available water is constantly diminishing, in some places there is a growing tendency, despite its scarcity, to privatise this resource, turning it into a commodity subject to the laws of the market. Anybody want to just comment on that sentence? Any, any economist here who can spot something of an oddity about that sentence? Yeah? I guess it doesn't make sense to say it turns into a commodity because Implicitly, everything already is, and it only didn't uh, matter as much because it was available uh, in enough um, mass. Yeah, okay. So, um, if something is not scarce, it doesn't have to be subject to the laws of the market. 
It's only if something is scarce that the price mechanism is important for uh, allocating uh, scarce resources and, and for encouraging conservation and all the rest of it. So, so to say, despite its scarcity, it's wrong that people want to make it into a commodity subject to the laws of the market is, uh, well, I don't want to be too critical, but it, it, it is totally absurd. It's only because of its scarcity that one would ever want to make it subject to the laws of the market. Now, you may argue that you still don't want to make it subject to the laws of the market, but if water was not scarce, you wouldn't want to make it subject to the laws of the market because there's no need to. It's free. There's, it's so abundant, there's no need to, uh, uh, in, in any sense, um, enshrine property rights in it, uh, have markets in it, because it would have a, a zero price. It's only because it's scarce that you might even want to consider it in, in, the, in the first place. And then he goes on. Yet access to safe, drinkable water is a basic and universal human right, since, it's a, since it is essential to human survival, and as such is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. Anything odd about this sentence, do you think, uh, when uh, um, combined with the last phrase of that sentence? What, what else might you consider as being a human right, other than water? Something quite closely related to water. Property, perhaps. Property, yeah, OK. Um, sh shelter, yeah. Food. Food, yeah, OK. So does this mean that um, food shouldn't be subject to the laws of the market because it's a human right as well? This is just a, um, it's a, it's, uh, a false dichotomy and, and, and an absurdity in many ways and just takes one down a, um, a, a path which is extremely uh, un unproductive. Indeed, it's more than unproductive. It's actually um, uh, tragic because if one is m m uh, managing water resources and so on in, uh, um, in a way that's not sustainable, it actually has very serious consequences, for, um, especially for the world's poorest people. And essentially, if water is not priced, if it's not subject to the laws of the market, uh, it will be wasted. Let me just give you two or three examples, but there's a huge literature on this. Um, so, in, uh, let's take a Western example uh, to begin with. So, California is um, regularly subject to really dire water shortages. And by one account, over the years, farmers in California have paid just 15% of the capital costs of the federal system that delivers water um, to farmers in California. Rather unsurprisingly, unlike anywhere else in the world, in California only 4% of, um, of, um, of water that's used, of water that is used is then recycled and reused. Why? Because it's not priced, somebody else is paying for it, it's free to the farmers, so they just uh, essentially waste it and don't find ways to recycle. Um, if water is not priced, then water-thirsty crops will be grown in places where water is scarce. You'll get inefficient irrigation systems and so on. Around, and you might think of this in terms of drinking water and household water and these uh, real important and urgent needs that we all have um, for water. But 95% of water is used for industrial and agricultural purposes. And if um, markets are not used to allocate water rights and if water is not priced, it will be systematically wasted and used um, inefficiently. It's property rights um, in commodities such as water uh, which actually encourages conservation and encourages industrial and agricultural uses in a way which um, is, um, is efficient. Growing water-thirsty crops in places where water is abundant rather than growing water-thirsty crops in places where the water is very scarce. Secondly, as I've, I've just mentioned, linking... Um, a desire uh, to have property rights in water in a negative way to the fact that it's a human right is very strange. Food, shelter and clothing are all regarded by the Catholic Church as human rights. Are we supposed to believe that we shouldn't have markets in clothing or property rights in clothing? Um, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, as, as an argument, even as a, as a starting point for discussion. The church has supported property rights and markets in these things because they perform an important uh, social function and promote the common good. Uh, property rights and the pricing of water um, perform the important social function of ensuring that water isn't wasted, that it's conserved, and that water-intensive agriculture and industrial activity um, take place in places where water is more abundant. <coughs> Um, 
Now, I want to uh, return to this question of, of property rights and, and the environment more generally. As I mentioned, people across the political spectrum, uh, not sort of hardline central planning socialists, but communitarian socialists um, through to free market liberals, uh, have been interested in the last 30 or 40 years in this uh, question of, how, of property rights being important in order to um, preserve uh, environmental goods. Um, and the importance of property rights for the environment is often considered in um, the context of uh, an article which was written by Garrett Hayden called The, the Tragedy of the Commons. Um, that article is worth reading because it's short and because it's such a terrible article in almost um, uh, every respect. It talks about trying to uh, uh, limit human breeding using these kinds of phrases because of the uh, impact of uh, uh, humans on the environment and all, all the rest of it. Uh, but it, 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 um, it's, it's short and it illustrates in a really stark way where a lot of environmentalists uh, are coming from. Now, in that article, uh, uh, Hayden refers to something called the tragedy of the commons, and that's often attributed to Hayden, but Hayden was actually referring back to a much older pamphlet written by an Anglican uh, clergyman called William uh, Foster Lloyd. And um, William Foster, Foster Lloyd introduced the concept of the tragedy of the commons, whereby common land, if it was open to grazing um, by all, would very soon be overgrazed, because I get the benefits of putting another uh, cow or sheep or whatever on the common land, because um, at the margin I benefit from um, having an extra cow, but the cost of overgrazing is spread amongst all the users of the common. So if you have an open common um, with free grazing rights, um, no private property to regulate those grazing rights, then you'll get the destruction of the uh, uh, environmental common resource. And there are lots of uh, mechanisms which have evolved, I think especially in Switzerland actually, but also in Austria, to try to regulate um, and provide forms of private property right in grazing land to try to stop this overgrazing. I think a much better example, and certainly an example which is highly relevant to the European Union, is the um, over, uh, overfishing of, of fishing grounds. So if you don't have private property rights in, um, in, in fishing grounds, if I take a boat out, if I take a trawler out and fish some extra tuna, I get the benefit of the extra tuna, but the cost of me taking tuna out of the ocean in terms of the um, lower number of tuna which are available to breed and um, produce tuna uh, for future generations is spread across all users of the, um, uh, all, all trawler owners, not just now, but also in the future. And, and this is why if we don't have in, in those um, areas of the world where you don't have the uh, uh, private property rights vested in, uh, for example, fishing grounds, you have overfishing, and in the end, overfishing to the extinction of, um, of uh, species of fish, and that has happened in the European Union uh, in, in some cases. <clears throat> so undefined or unenforced property rights are, um, are a disaster for... Um, um, environmental outcomes, and, and this isn't uh, reasonably disputed by economists. Now, can, does anybody recognise this? Actually, there doesn't seem to be very well focused, but it, um, this, this is forest and green, and this is sort of desert and, uh, and uh, barren. Does anybody know where that is? Yeah. Yeah? I think that's Haiti, and also is uh, the Dominican, Dominican Republic. Republic. That's right, yeah, okay. So if you fly to America occasionally, you fly over, you, you've obviously seen this, have you seen this photo before? Or you I, have a, I, I read the... Oh, you read it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, so, um, uh, this is in a sense a natural experiment. Uh, th uh, this is the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. That's Haiti, that's the Dominican Republic. It, the, um, the land doesn't suddenly change from being unfertile to fertile as you move from uh, left to right. Um, it changes from being under the, uh, 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 under the jurisdiction of a government which has absolutely no respect for or civil institutions designed to protect property rights to a government which is not exactly the best in the world from that point of view but at least has adequate um, protection of, um, of, of property rights and, and, and so on. So as the United Nations put it, I'm not sure whether that's... Um, yeah. Um, 
Environmental degradation in the worst affected parts of the Haitian border zone is almost completely irreversible due to a near total loss of vegetation cover and productive topsoil across um, wide areas. So in effect, the Haitian side of the border is a huge ungoverned um, and unowned commons. And um, Haiti is pretty much a failed state. It's ranked um, 11th in the foreign policy index of uh, um, uh, foreign policy fragile state index back in 2015 with countries like Zimbabwe and, um, and North Korea ab ab above it. And it's got a terrible record of corruption. It ranks 175 out of 182 countries in the Transparency International Corruption uh, Index. And in relation to Haiti, the Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom states that clear titles to property are virtually non-existent. Now, by no means is the Dominican Republic um, perfect, but it ranks about halfway up most of these uh, indices, particularly when it comes to the protection of property rights. And Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, I think, are particularly interesting because of their proximity to each other. But there are abundant um, uh, examples and evidence of um, how, when you don't vest private property rights in things like fisheries, forests, farmland, and, and so on, that it simply gets um, uh, abused uh, to the point of total destruction. Uh, this is the case in, um, in, 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 for example, the Amazon rainforest, in African forests, uh, and, and so on. And, and modern economics here, which uh, no, what, it, this is, uh, really is an area of, uh, of economics where the, um, the empirical evidence and the practice backs up uh, the theory, is really just a reiteration of the points which are made by uh, Thomas Aquinas. If something is owned, then people will care for it because they will get the benefits of caring for it, they'll get the benefits of, um, uh, of ownership. If something is owned by everybody, um, insofar as anything can be owned by everybody, what incentive is there for me to actually put some effort into caring for that environmental resource or indeed do anything else other than um, uh, fishing it, if it's a fishery, uh, to destruction or uh, grazing it to um, the point at, at which it's become, uh, it becomes uh, exhausted as, as a resource. Now, there are a few developments of this argument that I'd just like to, to, to add, but I won't, won't discuss in detail, but as, as pointers, if you like, for um, uh, further discussion. Um, first of all, property rights need protection in the law and effective systems of enforcement. And th this includes the protection of implicit property rights as well. For example, the property rights of indigenous people um, in uh, Amazon rainforests. So a, a, a lot of um, uh, forest clearing in countries such as Brazil arises because you, uh, because you don't have the effective protection of property rights which do, uh, which do exist. So big agribusinesses, for example, just ride rough, roughshod over implicit and explicit property rights and destroy a resource, clear it, and, and farm it. So most of the um, uh, forest destruction which happens in South American countries, and in particular Brazil, uh, is illegal. So you not only need private property rights, but you also need effective juridical systems to um, uh, ensure those property rights are, uh, are, are um, uh, enforced. But it doesn't help if you, uh, you know, to, to, to point to somewhere like Brazil and say you still get forest destruction because you don't have good juridical systems to enforce private property rights. It's, um, it, 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 it would not help the situation if you then simply said, okay, we won't have private property rights at all because it's difficult to enforce them. That would just lead to total anarchy and destruction of the environmental uh, resource. Um, secondly, there may be situations um, where it is felt that it's it is appropriate for, um, prudentially, for the government to regulate the use of environmental resources in particular ways. And there's, there's no doubt that this has been um, done successfully in, in countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom in order to reduce the um, uh, say air pollution in cities and, and this type of thing. It's very difficult to regulate something um, if its ownership is not defined, because if its ownership is not defined, um, who do you um, take action against if those regulations are broken? 
So even if you do believe that regulation and government intervention is necessary for the uh, protection of environmental resources, a prerequisite for that is actually the is, is well-defined property rights in those resources in the first place. And um, thirdly, I'd just like to note that um, there's, there's been an awful lot of work done in the last um, 20 or 30 years by <coughs> somebody called Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009. And um, she died in uh, 2013, and um, her, her work has an amazing resonance, in fact, with, with Catholic social teaching in a, in, a num in a number of ways, but oddly was not, um, has a resonance with, despite the fact that she was totally unaware of, uh, of Catholic social teaching. But amazingly, despite that, and despite the fact that all her work, or nearly all her work, relates to the preservation of environmental resources in poor communities. Um, there was, it, it, both in the process of developing Laudato Si and in Laudato Si itself, there's no recognition of this great body of work um, that that's, that's, uh, is going on. And um, Ostrom's thesis was simple. Actually, it's two Ostroms. It's uh, Eleanor Ostrom and also her husband, Vincent uh, Ostrom. That communities from the bottom up often develop mechanisms of controlling the use of environmental resources, um, fish <coughs> and forests in particular, that are remarkably stable and effective. And communities also develop their own systems of enforcement. And the main role of government, Ostrom argued, was to, um, if any at all, was to support those systems and not take them over. So uh, one example of that would be in... Uh, uh, say fisheries, where local fishing communities would um, agree among themselves uh, how long boats could go out to sea in order to catch fish. And if people um, went beyond the, lim the, the, the time limit, the number of days or number of hours per day that uh, they were allowed to uh, uh, go out to sea in which they had agreed between themselves, then some kind of community, community form of sanction would be imposed. Often that would be just shaming the boat owner. Uh, leaving a, a pink ribbon on their door or something like that so everybody knew that they were the uh, offender. And in a close-knit community, uh, if you uh, had a ribbon on your door, you wouldn't tend to offend twice because you would be really looked down upon. And th there's a, a, a huge body of work that these community mechanisms of implicit property rights and the, and, um, the enforcement of property rights and environmental resources have been much more effective um, than either the outright uh, individualization of property rights on a Western model, um, or the state taking over of, um, of, of property rights and the regulation of property rights on, on the other hand. And, um, and, and when you do have them, the natural resource tends to be nurtured rather than, uh, that ra rather than um, destroyed, as often happens, especially in a poorly governed state when the state is responsible for the uh, ownership and regulation of environmental resources. Now, finally, um, just... I've uh, oh, done that. that that's on the rostrum. Actually, that, if you click on that, there is a little video of, of her. Are you distributing the slides? Uh, yeah, OK. So if you click on this slide, um, th there's a, vid a video, a YouTube video embedded uh, in, in that of uh, Ellen Rostrum speaking for three or four minutes. And she, on, on the same day, that, or the day after she won the Nobel Prize, <coughs> there was an article in the um, uh, Guardian, which is the, the sort of left-leaning intellectual paper in the United Kingdom, saying how wonderful her work is. And on the same day, I wrote an article in the, in the Telegraph, which is the sort of free market conservative equivalent, um, also saying how wonderful her work is. So this is you know, the kind of work which is just admired right across the political spectrum, it's totally in accordance, um, her, no, her principles are totally in accordance with Catholic social teaching. You can see the word solidarity there, but um, the word subsidiarity could also equally a, a appear behind a, um, a, 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 um, a, 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 on a, a, a placard related to a, a, a talk by uh, Ostrom. Yet it, yet, yet it appears that this great body of work, which has won at least one Nobel Prize, was just en entirely um, uh, ignored. 
uh, which, which I, I find uh, especially odd. Um, okay, finally, uh, trade-offs. Um, so I, I think Laudato Si uh, dealt with the issue of uh, trade-offs, which are genuinely difficult, but they, they can't be ignored in relation to these environmental questions. And the people who were going on the cl climate strike yesterday, I also think ignore these uh, important issues of, of trade-offs. So when it comes to things like global warming, and I'm in no sense somebody who is skeptical of the scientific consensus in global warming, there is a genuine choice between um, policies which allow more economic growth, which allow us to deal with immediate environmental problems more effectively, uh, which uh, if you have economic growth, it increases resilience to environmental and uh, climate events and bad weather events and this type of thing, uh, and, take, and policies which would reduce carbon emissions, which might reduce global warming in the future, but would slow down development today. So despite the increase, at least in recorded um, bad weather events in the world, there's been a huge fall in, um, uh, in deaths and injuries from bad weather events in the world. And the reason for that is because as the world becomes more developed, we become more resilient to um, problematic uh, uh, climate events, hurricanes and uh, heat waves and, and so on. Um, if you compare, say, Holland to Bangladesh, both of those are very, very low-lying countries, if there's a, a, a bad um, climate event that which uh, affects Holland, almost certainly that in such an event nobody will be killed. In Bangladesh, tens of thousands will be killed. So you have this... The, the, these trade-offs are not unimportant. You can't just ignore them. You can't just say we will take any action necessary in order to reduce carbon emissions so that we reduce global warming in the future. Because by doing so, you may well slow down development and, and therefore reduce the resilience of, um, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, people when it comes to uh, problematic um, uh, 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 climate, climate events. And also, you... you if you don't allow development, you don't allow people to resolve uh, current environmental problems. So 2 billion people, for example, um, currently uh, um, burn animal dung, many of them in uh, houses without chimneys, which produces all sorts of poisonous gases, uh, 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 which is appalling for people's um, uh, um, uh, respiratory health. Uh, 2 billion people still burn an animal dung, as the main source of fuel. If such people were connected to a natural gas system or an electricity system, you might get more carbon emissions, or you might, you might not actually, because, um, but uh, you might well get more carbon emissions, but on the other hand, these people's um, uh, uh, immediate local environment would improve um, dramatically. Uh, now, uh, I think this, this kind of illustrates the uh, uh, issue of trade-offs quite well. So in, in Laudato Si there was a, uh, a comment saying that, uh, I can't remember it was a footnote, but there was this very direct attack on air conditioning and um, s saying that people shouldn't be using air conditioning. And, and I think that this, this gives a, a good indicate, this is a good example of trade-offs. So this is, um, this is air conditioning using uh, modern technology. It, it costs almost nothing and it's very effective, and I'll say how effective in a moment. This is air conditioning before modern technology, which um, to get, to get um, eight hours of air conditioning required 16 man-hours of labour and a large number of ostriches, and was only available to very um, uh, well-off or important um, people, whereas modern air conditioning is available to almost everybody. And the development of air conditioning has led to a reduction of 80% in deaths from heat in the United States over the last century. 80%. And it's becoming more and more important in hospitals in India and other uh, hot countries. And again, it directly reduces um, uh, deaths from um, uh, heat exhaustion and so on uh, when it's employed. It's also facilitated, interestingly, um, significant population movements from the north of the US to the south of the US, where it was just simply too hot to live uh, for um, most people until the widespread adoption of air conditioning. And much less carbon is necessary to um, 
uh, make hot places cool via air conditioning, such as Texas, than is needed to make cool places hot, like Chicago, in, um, in winter via uh, heating. So there's a trade-off um, uh, here. And there's lots of ap apocalyptic language used by the church uh, by, in Laudato Si uh, in relation to uh, things like this. But yes, no, it's true that air conditioning gives rise to carbon emissions, but air conditioning also uh, hugely increases the resilience of people in the face of hot weather. And as I say, to the extent of actually reducing deaths from heat exhaustion in the United States by 80% in the last century. <clears throat> okay, and there's lots of other apocalyptic stuff um, in, in Laudato Si as well, which just doesn't recognise the improvement in um, uh, the natural environment that's taken place in the last 20 or 30 years. Deforestation in the world has collapsed in the last, um, uh, ten, in, in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, where, where the uh, rate of net deforestation has, has decreased enormously and there are very few countries with a national income per head of over $4,000 a year which actually have net, net deforestation. In most countries, and including the European Union, I should add, uh, forest cover is increasing um, quite dramatically. So, to, just to, to conclude, these, these issues are, um, uh, are, are, are really, really crucial. Nobody uh, doubts the importance of questions such as climate change, global warming, other aspects of environmental resource um, degradation. If, you're, if, you're, if you rely for your living on the vibrancy of a fishing ground and all of a sudden it becomes exhausted, it can be a matter of life or, life or death. So it's important that the church comments uh, on these issues. And the theology uh, underlying that comment, I think, has always been, uh, has been very solid. And, but those theological insights do have to be complemented by prudential judgments on issues to do with government policy, political economy, economics, and, and so on. And I would argue that the evidence is very strong that markets and the protection of private property rights are essential for the um, uh, preservation and nurturing of environmental goods. And this is something which uh, you can um, deduce from the writings of people like Thomas Aquinas, but it appears not to be stretched, uh, stressed at all in um, the statements by the Catholic Church over the last 40 or 50 years, and I should add by any public statements I've seen by any other uh, non-Catholic uh, denomination. Um, so I would question whether the right conclusions and recommendations have been made when it comes to these uh, economic and, and political issues. To too great a degree, markets are attacked, I think, and central planning of a tool of economic organisation is implicitly um, supported. And this encourages the uh, uh, movements such as those we saw yesterday to attach themselves to the, even the extreme forms of... Um, of, of, of socialism and left-wing activism, which, as we've seen in the um, uh, 40 years following the Second World War, have been more destructive for, uh, in terms of environmental resources, probably, than any other form of political organisation which has ever um, uh, stalked um, the earth. Thanks.